Welcome, church family, and it's good to see everybody, and welcome to our time of interviewing with Pastor David and Marie, and it's always a joy to have you guys with us and joining us and being able to talk and share with the church things regarding to marriage, things regarding to relationships, and it's always great to hear from you guys both. So welcome. It's good to have you guys with us here today. Good to have a place to be. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> You know, I've asked this now three weeks in a row. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. I mean, I don't, I don't, enjoy, I'm not enjoying the fact that we can't come to church and see our, our, our body mm. um, and have services here. But we're doing okay. I'm looking forward to, to when this all ends and, and uh, looking forward to coming to church. Yes. Coming with the body of Christ. It's going to be one of those glorious things where we get back together and and everybody's excited and and uh, see, being with one another. You know, as you mentioned, Pastor, we've been here. And Marie, you've been here as well. We've uh, come on Sunday mornings. You're here on Sunday mornings to greet people. And and uh, it's interesting. It's cool to see the people that are coming in just recently. This last week, we saw pe more people coming and wanting to spend time and chit-chat and pray and so that's just a small sample size of what's really what people really wanted to come back. Yeah, we when we were here this last Sunday, people don't know that I haven't been obviously telling people that I've been here on the campus. I don't know what difference that really ultimately <laughs> would make anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just nice when they come rolling up and they see us here. And uh, like you know, as as occurred just this last week with uh, several people who stopped in visited. It was nice to visit with them, hear their story. One one couple was here, uh, has been here since 1992, mm. 28 years. And it's the very first time I ever had an opportunity to even meet them, you know. And so for me, I'm amazed that, um, that they've been here that long, frankly, and that I hadn't encountered them. But what a blessing it was to be able to not only in you know, engage in conversation and visit with them, but to pray with them and minister to them. So, yeah, Marie and I are doing doing well, as she just said. Um, and yes, we both we both miss being able to be with our congregation, with our church family, an awful lot. We miss it a lot. And uh, for for us, I think that ultimately. Um, it's helped us to value relationships more than we had in the past. I think you can take for granted mm -hmm. the things that have always been there. Yes. And when they're removed from you in the way that this has been removed from us, it, it makes you think and uh, makes you appreciate. And I'm assuming that I might be speaking for most, most of my church and maybe most people. To be forced into isolation is not a good thing. And so I look forward to being able to be back, going back to minister in the way that we do on a personal level. I, I can see that I'm going to be more involved on a personal level with people than I have been in, in some time. I can see that. And I look forward to, to being able to uh, interact with people, to visit with them. And um, yeah, when we are able to finally get back together, it's going to be like a family reunion, and we're looking forward to it, John, as soon as possible. Yeah. Yes. It's, go ahead, Marie. I'm sorry. No. I didn't I'm, want to I'm, cut I'm you just off. agreeing with him. We're, we're already figuring out what we want to do when the first time um, if our church opens back, you know, what if, mm. you know, the things that we want to have the, here. You know, one of the things that you're mentioning, when, you, when we do come back, were there things that you thought about that you would do different? When you came back, you know, one of the things I've been even looking within the ministries that I've been blessed to oversee is so what are what am I going to do different that it's going to be effective and, and going to be just, I was caught off guard. I think all of us were caught off guard by this whole thing. And uh, it's allowing me to prep and be better prepared in case anything like this happens again. Well, I suspect that some of the things that have occurred since we haven't been able to meet will continue. As uh, I've been mentioning, um, we have seven-day-a-week church now. Mm -hmm. Seven-day-a-week, John, as you know. 
Monday, our, our Young Adults is broadcast, and I know our junior high and high school have been broadcasting. Our Tuesday Men's Study has been broadcasting online. We've been doing more Facebook Live. I do Facebook Live on Tuesday, and on Thursday, we have our Wednesday night. You know, online, we have a Friday, a Q&A with Marie and me. On Saturday, we have our... Um, uh, uh, marriage and family series that we're doing right now. We do our two morning services on Sunday online. We added a two o'clock mm. service online. We do our uh, Sunday night. So, um, so many things the ki the kids ministry has been putting on things for for our children. So we we really came out of the, you know, we 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 came out of the box, if you will. We we. We should have been doing this all along, <laughs> but there was no real need for it all along, and there is now. And what I expect is that we will continue doing these kinds of things. We'll continue having online nights of worship, continue to have a variety of things that that are still in the planning stages, as well as resuming the normalcy of our church. So... You know, we've been seeing quite a number of responses for from our viewers, uh, listeners from our church, and I, I would encourage any who are listening to this right now to contact us. Let us know that you're listening. To share these things with your friends, let them know that there are things that are that are happening in your fellowship right now that would be a benefit to them. Because I really believe, and Marie and I together have believed all along that uh, the things that, that God's Word has for us are things that we need to be in every day. And so there are options and opportunities that, that this uh, virus, if you will, have given us opportunity to respond to. And so, as I've been saying, and this is the thing that the Lord laid on my heart, what the enemy meant for evil, God intended Amen. for good. Amen. And we're seeing good from this. How has it for both of you personally how has this been a benefit <clears throat> for you in terms of have you looked at within yourself? Has it increased your faith? Has it this whole time? Because there was a time when this all went down, this whole coronavirus. There was a moment where thoughts crossed of, man, the church can shut down. Mm -hmm. And and now we see what the Lord's really doing. Has there been a benefit to all of this, to your faith? I think so, John. I think that we have to trust the Lord. You know, I, you know, do you, do you, I trust him? I mean, you know, I think the question is, do you trust him in this, whatever may happen? And I, and, and I, we, I think that Dave and I both have fully trusted in the Lord to, to do a new thing, mm -hmm. a good thing. And, um, and, um, I think through the minis different ministries that have be started here, you know, reaching out to the community on Facebook, YouTube, mm -hmm. and all that, even in the women's ministry, um, devotions, you know, we're putting out devotions, we're putting out, um, 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 uh, uh, we're doing exercises too, <laughs> you know, we have one of the, a couple of the gals leading exercises, you know, um, Connie and I are, are talking to people um, through the uh, internet, and um, you know, so it, it's been it's been a good thing, and um, because you get different perspectives mm -hmm. too, as you as maybe you interview different people, you know, we've been trying to do some of that interviewing and asking people, what are you doing? What do you, how are you doing? And what's going on? And but it has I, I um, never in my day would have thought anything like this. We came straight back, uh, straight home from Israel, and all of a sudden, we're, you know, basically, you know, yeah. we're, we're... Pastor, for you, has it has it uh, been a benefit for your faith? You know, it, it's been a reminder, and in, in some ways, it's been a um, purifier, because um, as I mentioned recently on a Wednesday night Bible study, um, I was watching the news on a um, weekend, and my son Joseph and his wife Karina and our baby Olivia, my grandbaby, our granddaughter, mm -hmm. uh, had just moved into the house, you know, uh, because they were doing some work in their home, and so they vacated their home, and, you know, 
we had room for them. So they came and lived with us while the construction was taking place, which for me is a great blessing to be able to have, uh, you know, Joseph and Karina and my my Olivia, our our baby girl. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's a pleasure and a joy for them to be with us and and all of that. And so Joseph was sitting, um, you know, with me as I was watching the news and and they said everything is shut down. All churches are shut down. And uh, that hit me hard, John. It hit me hard because, as you know, our, our church is built on Jesus as the chief cornerstone. And so we call him our, our, our foundation, of course, the Word of God. And uh, Jesus Christ himself revealed in the Word of God as our chief cornerstone. But we built our fellowship on a philosophy of ministry that included what we called our four pillars, the Word of God, worship of God, the withness. We invented a word, withness, for a W. Speaking of fellowship and and then the witness, because we believe that God's word and worship contribute to the reality of a community that is a Jesus people community that takes his word out and becomes a witness. Right. And so those four pillars have been uh, the center of our church's philosophy and activity for 39 years I, as I was here waiting um as Marie was sharing, and I was thinking, now, but what I share, I began to think about that because our church actually has been meeting together um, before we called ourselves by the name of a church called Calvary Chapel Chino Valley for 39 years. We celebrate our 39th Sunday morning service in July, hmm. but we were already meeting as a group of people prior to that on Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. So for 39 years, We've been meeting together with people who became our church. And the very first Sunday morning in July that we gathered together, I laid out that we would be a new thing. I, I, I taught out of Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. And God tells us, don't remember the things of the past. Behold, I do a new thing. And in that new thing, as I was sharing with our church, I said, we're going to have four pillars. And those four pillars I just mentioned. And so community to me, fellowship, mm -hmm. it's extremely important. And so our church has been built on Jesus Christ, our chief cor cornerstone, and these four elements of biblical living that have made us into a group of people that are more than, than people who show up on a Sunday. We're a family in many ways because the church is broken down into groups and subgroups. We have so many women's groups. We have many men's yes. groups. We have uh, children's ministry events. We have, name it, we've got all these yes. various kinds of ministries that break this uh, this mega church into small groups. And so all of a sudden we don't have community anymore. And so I, I was sitting there watching the news when when they said churches are, are now locked down. Nobody can meet on Sundays. And um, with the lack of information and not knowing what's really taking place and even right now, after several weeks, nobody really knows yet because you get such conflicting <laughs> reports, and it really depends on the political bias of the reporter at that time as to whether or not they see value in the church, value in community, because we see that. We see that abortion clinics are still open mm -hmm. because that's necessary, and, and that uh, marijuana dispensaries are, are necessary, and drive-in theaters are necessary. They're essential, and liquor stores are essential, and and all of that. We see all this stuff that they say is essential, but, but gathering together as a group of people to worship God and have community, oh, that's not essential. You can go to a bowling alley in some places. You're actually going bowling, but you cannot be too close to another believer in Christ. And for us, you know, I, I don't see that as a direct uh, attack from, from people who hate Jesus Christ. I really don't. I see that as just the way the world thinks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when the world begins to think of what means something, what is valuable, the church is normally not in that mix. We, we live in a society that values nurses more than they value clergy. And because that's true, you know, I was there aware that what is happening is an undermining of one of the pillars of what Christianity is, which is getting together, like it says in Acts 2, 42 through 47, you know, to remain constant and steadfast in, in fellowship and doctrine and breaking of bread and prayer. All of that are essentials. So I was sitting there, and they said, the churches are locked down, and I turned to Joseph. And when I turned to Joseph, 
He said, Dad, it's going to be okay. Well, my son knows these things. He's been raised in faith. He loves Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. he, he, he's, he knows. But I said, you don't understand. Because what this is is really an attack on the essentials of what a Christian is and what a church is. Mm -hmm. And I said, and, and son, I said, you don't understand how that's going to impact my church. Because we are built on community. Community that is around Christ. And now we can't meet. And I, I teared up. I mean, anybody who knows me knows that when something matters to me, um, the emotions are very real, and they will well up. And my eyes watered. And it bothered him quite a bit to see his father so upset. And I was. And why wouldn't I be? You know, I'm thinking about it. And I told him, I said, son, I said, I knew and I know that, that the Lord will will one day remove me from ministry. I know that. I will no longer be the pastor of this church. I have uh, awareness of that. I know that. I'm not opposed to that. I want God to do what God wants to do, son. I said, but I didn't know that this could be the way mm -hmm. that I was removed from ministry. I said, and I said, I'm greatly concerned over what's going to take place in my fellowship and the church God gave to me. And I teared up in front of him, and he got very quiet. And I went to bed later on, and I was praying. You know, I, you know, the Scripture says to pray um, without ceasing. And, and that's not just getting on your knees at certain times. It means to have a constant communication, a constant prayer life, talking to God. And I, 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 I pray without ceasing. I am constantly forming prayers in my heart and mind and sharing with the Lord. This is what I'm thinking. This is how I'm feeling. What am I supposed to do? That's my way of life. And so I was about to go to sleep, and I was praying, God, you've got to give me peace. You've got to direct me. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I woke up in the morning, and as I was driving to the office, uh, the Holy Spirit reminded me of what he told me in my own heart through a prayer time I had with him. 38 years ago, when we were looking for some property, we had to find a place to go. Um, there was nothing on the horizon that I could see. And I was crying out to the Lord, as I have for so long, for this church. And I said to him, God, I don't know what we're going to do. We don't have a place to go. They're kicking us out of the building that we've been renting. I don't know what we're going to do, what's going to happen. And his still small voice spoke to my heart in a way that I'll never forget. He said, I did not raise you up to let you fall. It's funny that that's the same kind of thing he said to my own pastor, Chuck Smith, when Chuck was concerned about some property they were buying in Costa Mesa, and they didn't have the, the finances for it. And, and he said, God, we don't have the money. And God told him, you know, I'll take care of that need. And that's when they sold a, a corner piece of property there that became a gas station. Mm -hmm. And the money that they received for that corner lot, just a portion of the acreage, finished off what they needed in order for them to complete their building project. And so the Lord spoke to my heart in a similar way. He said, I didn't raise you up to let you fall. Philippians tells us in chapter 1, I believe, verse 6, you know, he who began a good work will continue it and complete it. And so I got, I got peace in my heart. And I came into the office this happened on the way to the office, and I got came into the office with a new attitude. And um, and though we didn't have church services and and all the following week, um, the Lord has shown Himself faithful mm -hmm. to us in every way, every way that has has been needed, and He He meets our need. And so, what have I learned? I I I've relearned. Uh, I have relearned that. Um, God, God raised this church up, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, I relearned that. And and I also learned something else that Maria's been trying to convince me of for for many years. She said, I, I, she said, David, she says, your church loves you. Because mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't thought so for a long time. And so when she said that, she says, your people love you. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that to be true, too. So those are things that I've learned. Amen. Yes, and and to yes, church family, you know how much we love our pastor, and Marie. It, it's just amazing. But me more. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know if people really see the work that you both put in behind the scenes week in and week out for our church and being able to be blessed to be a part of this staff. I, I do see a portion of it and how you, uh, travail and, 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 uh, over the scriptures and wrestle the scriptures to produce godly people in our church to give the word leading the women, you know, and, uh, and all the things that you guys go through that a lot of people don't see because of your love for the church. Being able to see that on a small scale allows me to appreciate and love you guys as much as I do. And so uh, just remember my birthday is March 1st. <laughs> you know, you can give me some uh, gifts, right, Pastor? If you're still around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Marie, uh, you know, the week before last we spoke about marriage and, and uh, I want to just highlight some of the things that we spoke about that week before last. And you were sharing, Marie, about the role of the wife, giving husbands undivided attention and listen to them, not speak badly of him, but rather with respect. Can you share a little bit more about that, uh, about how important it is that the husband, the wife is on the same team of the husband? Oh, I think it's very important. Um, you can either you can either build your husband up or you can tear him down uh, through your through the use of your language and um, and the way you speak to him. And I'm thankful I did have a mom who was who never tore my da dad down. I'm thankful for that because I brought that into our ma marriage. I I uh, you know I love my husband. I mean um, and um, 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 I don't think I've really ever, I mean, we've had our times of, uh, what's the word of, um, times of. You being wrong. <laughs> you know, and you being wrong. <laughs> I mean, we've had our arguments and, so, so, you know, and there are times, but not really, not, not where we were so angry with one another. I, I, I you know, I, you know, you, you can disagree to disagree mm -hmm. and sometimes and, but we agree most of the time. I mean, you know, I I uh, I don't have any issues with my husband, um, and um, and I, I I've already I've always uh, respected him, and um, so I I uh, and that's important. I think women need to respect their husband. They shouldn't be making your husband. You shouldn't be making your husband look foolish. You know, especially in front of other people, mm -hmm. especially, I, I think. Of, um, I know of a woman who constantly, uh, as a believer, was constantly on her husband's um, back, constantly, mm -hmm. because he wasn't uh, a great believer, you know. He would, you know, um, and he would, you know, he wasn't doing the things that, a, a, you know, a godly man leading the home, you know, he wasn't leading the home. But, but she just co constantly... Uh, was on, on him always, 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 and um, and um, and it tore him down. He finally got to a place where he did, he did uh, uh, come come around. However, um, I think it had to take her to to keep her mouth quiet, <laughs> you know, and to learn some lessons because um, you know we can tear our husbands down with our and with our our mouth and um, and our words and it it, it is uh, never fruitful. There's no, no fruit from it whatsoever, and um, the only person that looks bad is you. <laughs> you know, too, when you hear a woman just nagging and talking bad about her husband. You know, instead of instead of keeping her mouth quiet and praying for him mm -hmm. on his behalf. You know that God would do work in him, but that God would bless him. That and that for herself. That Lord make me a woman that my husband uh, that I can that my husband will love and enjoy me and and just um, honor me and 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 as well let me honor my husband and and the way that he is the head of the home after all. You know that's uh, important in, in Proverbs thirty one. It talks about. Uh, the husband's heart safely trusts in her, mm -hmm. or she holds her husband's heart in her hands. Mm -hmm. And that's so important when you know, and you know this, Pastor, you've been 
married almost three times the mm-hmm. time I've been married. But to know when you're, you can safely trust in your wife and mm-hmm. uh, that, w- that you have a wife that supports and is behind and encouraging. Mm-hmm. You know, the Proverbs talks about the contentious woman mm-hmm. continual dripping, you know, and, or on the corner of a rooftop. How encouraging it is to, uh, to have a wife that is just encouraging and supportive. You know, I, I married a very good woman, John, and, and it's just true. You know, I married a very good woman, and Marie's mama, Marie's mama is a very sweet woman. I love her very much. And her grandmother, Marie's mother's mama, was an amazing woman. So there is a, a trait in Marie's heritage of godly or sweet women. I'll put it that way, sweet women. Women who have gentle spirits and kind dispositions. So when I met Marie, you know, she came from that heritage, and it and uh, it, it shows uh, in the way she thinks and the way she acts. And I, I know that I have a, a wife that is very unusual. I I know that, but it took an unusual woman to be with an unusual person like me. So God, I believe, formed her for someone like me. And so she has filled in the gaps of my life. Marie doesn't have the disposition towards verbal control. I mean, every person has influence. Every wife has influence over the husband. It's not as if she doesn't exert her womanly influence. She does. But she has learned how to exert it in a way that doesn't make me feel threatened or controlled or dominated. You know, she's learned. She's, she's learned how to say this is what I want or this is what I need in a way that makes me want to, to meet that need. If she were demanding, we'd have an entirely different mm-hmm. relationship if, because I'm hard-headed, you know, as every husband I know is, you know, to some degree. And so... I was raised in a home prior to my mom coming to faith in Christ. I was raised in a home with a, an angry mother. You know, I loved my mom with all my heart. But mama was angry. And my mom was very controlling and very dominating. Um, and it took a long time for her to finally begin to change. And it came after 25 years of being married to my father. And so I grew up with this sense that I will not allow someone to have that kind of domination over me. My father was a very quiet man, very kind man. Get to a certain point, and you've already crossed the line. That was my dad. But my dad had a, a very great amount of patience, I would say, with yes. my mom. He, he was and I didn't have that patience. And so when Marie and I first were, were um, married, wasn't when we were dating. It was Usually you learn some things after marriage, you know. Yes. <laughs> and so when we first got married within the first year, Marie would try and explain to me in the way she did uh, how she felt. But I told her, and because I was a young man also, I said, that isn't the way that you approach me with those things because if you're looking to have an argument, then I am more than willing to have that because you are not my mother. And I actually said that. I said, I married a woman, not my mom. And I didn't know how else to say it. I'm very plain spoken. I've learned since then how to gently speak. But at that time, I'm just learning. No excuse, just that's the way it was. And so Marie began to adjust towards me. How how can I tell him what I need? And me, I began to adjust saying, I need to hear what she has to say. Eventually, what it became was a, a, I'd get a little quiet and let her talk. Then I'd go in another room, and I'd think, what is she saying? Because I might be in disagreement, and I would, I would think about it. She learned that I think about what she's saying. Then I'd come back out, and I'd say, I can see your point. You know? And we learned to discuss things that way. So over time, after all of these years, we kind of like are aware of where we're going, even when, when something feels like it's going somewhere. And, and I, might, I might say, you know where this is going to go. You want to rephrase that? And she'll say, yeah, and because I know she doesn't intend to, but it's just me. I sometimes come home from a stress-filled day or 
whatever, and it's me. It's not her most of the time. And so that's what has happened over time. She is, uh, you know, again, as a husband, uh, when the scripture says dwell with your wife according to knowledge, it's Peter's way of saying don't make your house into a hotel or a motel. Uh, know what's going on. Know the affairs of the home and get to know your your wife's language, the way she speaks, what she intends, what those words mean. And because some men are very good at telling you what their, their favorite sports team is all about and their history and, and their one-loss record and all of that. And there are a lot of guys that you know and I know who can tell you about their favorite golfer or they can tell you about their favorite baseball player and they know all about them, but they don't know their wives. Mm. And so I just made a decision that and we used to say it kind of like this. I used to say, and I said it to the church before, one of these days I'm going to retire. I, I will be out of full-time ministry one of these days, and I want to know the woman that I'm living with. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get to know her after I've retired and discovered there are things about her I didn't know. So I dwell with my wife according to knowledge. She is my ch chief study. She really is, outside of God's Word. I study my wife. I really do. I, I listen to the tone of her voice. I hear the words that she's speaking. I see how many times she's used a certain word or repeated a certain thing. You know, I watch her face. I really study my wife. And she can tell you that because even in our house, we have the kitchen area mm -hmm. and we have the, a sofa and a TV. And I'll be at the TV. And my son has been saying to me, Dad, you need to turn... The turn around and put the TV set over the fireplace and he wants to redecorate for me, you know, and I tell him I can't do that, son. Well, why not? I said, because when I'm sitting right where I'm at right now, I can look directly at your mom and I can see her and I can talk to her and I can just look and see that she's there and watch her. I said, and if my back is to her and I'm looking at a TV screen, I'm not looking at her. I said, so that's me. Uh, that's how I live, you know, again, um, there is, there, there's nobody more important to me in this entire world, uh, more than, you know, than my wife outside of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. I mean, that's not just saying it. That's, that's a fact, you know, and I was just, we were just talking yesterday about this just yesterday. Cause we talk about deep things, John. We don't just kind of, we talk about life. That's another advantage I have with her. And and I'll tell and I tell her, let's take care of ourselves because I don't want to be without you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be alone without you. Let's and, take care of our health. And I want the same thing. Yes. Let's take care of each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two little old people bouncing <laughs> around in the house taking care of each other. How old were you guys other. when you guys met? Marie was twenty two. I think so. Wow. I was twenty four. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Right. On, I just had turned just had turned twenty four. Just to turn 24. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you mentioned, and Marie, you said it, and then Pastor, you reiterated it, was the adjusting. And uh, I'm no expert in marriage, but I can see a lot of times when I've met with couples that the willingness to adjust to one another isn't there. Mm -hmm. And they're they're set in their ways in a way where, well, I'm not going to adjust and I'm not going to, because it's my way or the highway, whether that comes from the husband or the wife. But the importance, I've heard you both speak about it, even just now, that there's a time where it's almost denying yourself to adjust and allow ourselves to study our wives or our Absolutely. husbands. Yeah. And that's what we're supposed to do, to deny ourselves, to put one another above each other, one another, you know, uh, you know, put them first. Yeah. You know, Marie, last, uh, the time before last, you, you shared a, uh, a quote with me. Yes. Uh, and can you share that and speak a little bit about, about it's it? It's a quote from Michelle Sullivan. And yes, I thought it was, I, I enjoyed the, I thought it was interesting. Um, it said, her quote was on marriage, if you meditate on all things your husband does wrong, eventually you will find yourself married to someone you don't, you do not like. Mm. And I think uh, so many, unfortunately, women just, uh, allow themselves to just um, just beat their husbands down verbally and um, you know 
with their with their tongues. Would you would you say that would stem some from taking one another for granted? Oh that, sure, that I can think. happen. Not oh, I, th- you I think. Two, but if somebody's taking the other one for granted, there's exactly what oh. you just mentioned. There. Oh, of course. I think you know. Yes, you can take somebody. Yeah, you can think. Oh, they'll never leave me. You know. Um, I can I can act any way I want with my you know to my husband tell him all the uh, all these things that are unbecoming and 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 that are ru- that are cruel and then think the, the next moment things are just great <laughs> you know I, 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 I which I don't wouldn't I don't get you know, I don't I don't get p- people who can just turn like that on one another though I have seen it you know. Um, Yet, uh, what kind of marriage is that? Mm-hmm. It's very sad, very sad. And some people do do stay, you know, because they think they have no other place to go, frankly. You know, before the interview, we were just sharing about a scripture in Ecclesiastes. We're using it as a ministry principle, but again, uh, it's a it's a scripture that's used for marriage all the time. Uh, two chords. Mm-hmm. are better than when three okay. is not easily broken. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, how has that been uh, a verse that has been applied in your lives in terms of, I mean, there's so many obstacles that for all the years that you've been married and, and, and keeping your focus on Christ in the center of your marriage, I'm sure there's a lot of obstacles, a lot of things that have come down your way where it's been difficult. How has that verse really been true in your marriage? Flip first. Is that in the Bible? <laughs> because Maurice, you know, sharing the quote she just shared, talking about not taking each other for granted. We shared a little bit about adjusting. All those tie into to being able to not only look out for how we can better ourselves for our marriages, but it also looks at, and you said it perfectly, Marie. How do I put my husband before me in terms? How does that work in your marriage, being married for so long? I can tell you, I, I can, you know, I hate, I hate to, you know this about me, but I'll say it so that those who don't, uh, I'm not one of these guys who buys books on marriage. You know, I'm just not. I mean, you can have, you know, you know, men are from this planet and women are from that and all those books. And people love the easy, yeah. handy-dandy mm-hmm. guides to relationships. But though there may be some value in the insights these people give, each couple is different. You know, that's why I'd, when people ask me, what is a Christian marriage? You know, they're, they're, asking, they're asking me to define what they're supposed to have and then to put into some little box in many ways you know, certain ingredients that will make them happy with whatever it is that they have. And I, I, I believe that that um, somebody once said that marriage may be made in heaven, but it's worked out on earth. There is a um, there is a learning that you have that you have to go through in order to to understand what the two becoming one is. And so I think for Marie and me uh, and I speak it for myself, but I think she's in agreement with this. Um, we, we know that we're better together than we are apart. Mm-hmm. We, we know that uh, we have chosen each other. Yes. Uh, I, I, I chose her and she chose me. Mm-hmm. And, and we see that God, God is the one who orchestrated that choosing. Yes. I, I've never had, John, I have never had um, a sense that I married the wrong woman. I thought at one point she married the wrong man, but I've never felt that I married the wrong woman um, her goodness is has made me want to be a better man, and and Marie's kind of saying that in some ways when she's sharing her heart with you. Marie doesn't understand how a woman cannot love her husband. She doesn't understand that. Mm-mm. She doesn't. She doesn't understand. And I'm speaking for her. I'm just repeating though what she said yes. just a moment ago. She doesn't understand how a woman can put down her her husband, no matter, you know. She should, she, she, I'll put it this way, she shouldn't say things publicly. Some things, sometimes they need to talk about, get private counsel and all of that. I'm not saying that's not necessary sometimes. But but in real life, I mean, you stood before God in witnesses mm-hmm. and you promised to love one another. Mm-hmm. 
And for us, an oath to God matters. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe for some other people, John, maybe they don't know what that means. Maybe they didn't realize that when they said before God and witnesses, I will love you until the day I die, they didn't understand that. We did. You know, my oath was not made to witnesses, and it wasn't simply made to Marie. My oath was to God, mm -hmm. and I mean that. I mean that. I, I was nervous on our wedding day because I thought, am I able to keep this oath to love and to cherish until death do us part? Am I able to be that man? And by God's grace, I have been. And so neither she nor I really came from a background where divorce was an option. And we didn't come from a background where fighting was normal and being mean to your children was just a way of life. We did not come from that background. My mom was abusive to us. She was. My mom could verbally and sometimes physically abuse us. And I mean it in the way the word abuse is used today. My mom... When she, before she came to Christ, my mom abused us on occasions in a violent way, in a hurtful way, not only with physical violence, but with, uh, with verbal violence. There was a time in my home that I heard, I hate you much more than I ever heard, I love you. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with this, this sense of, there's gotta be something better than this. Then mama, then I got saved. I led my mom and dad to faith in Christ and mama's anger and stuff began to be dealt with by the Holy Spirit. And my dad became more warm and loving because Christ changes people. And, um, but I already knew in the back of my mind that what I did not want, what I would not be, you know, I had to learn to work that out, but I knew what I wasn't going to be. So God gave me Marie. And so when Marie loved me and, 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 oh, this, and, and God knows uh, I wasn't, aware of the depth another person can really have of love for you till I married this woman. And then she, she's, for all these years, John, she's, she's loved me. She's never done anything but love me. Well, how can that not change me? And why would I give something like that up? For what? For what? For me. You know what I mean? And so we're, we're from that background. We, you know, we just, we just know that all things are possible through Christ. We know that. Mm -hmm. We know that we're sinners who got married. And, but with him working together, that, you know, that, that threefold cord, Jesus being the one that keeps us together, John, we know that's true. And there's never been an option. Either one of us have ever entertained that, mm -hmm. that our life would be better without one another. Mm -hmm. it, it would not be better. And, uh, and that, that's, just, that's just, that's how a lot of people thought, John. That was the environment we grew up in. When, mm -hmm. when, I, when I was a kid, I only knew out of all of the neighborhood and all the kids I knew, I only knew two people from a divorced home. Mm. I only knew one person whose mama was working, and that was me. In my neighborhood, every mama stayed home and they took care of their families and they made right. dinner for husbands and they had Sunday dinners. In my home, my mama was ill and, and daddy was spending all of his money on doctor's bills and mama went to work and basically left me alone with my sisters for years and my brother got out of the house at 15. You know, so I, I knew what I didn't want. And when I met this girl here, you know, and she was a girl to me. She's still, I still call it my girl, you know, but when I met this girl here and she, she loved me um, and I knew that God gave her to me, um, that's how you make it. You know, Jesus Christ in the center of everything. We take what we have if there's a difference. And again, I, it's true when I say this, John, we, we have our differences. We're not the same person. We all have our, you know, she has ideas. I have ideas. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when we combine those ideas, they make a better us. And if that idea won't make me a better person and won't make us a better person together, 
then it's not worth it. That's how we are. And I don't know how to explain that. But it's just true. My kids can tell you that's true. Um, I'm better with her. And she's better with me. That's right. And somehow it worked. But it's because there is one who brought us together who we honor and fear. And that's, that's my Lord. Both of us do. Yes. And Dave is the one that brought me to Christ. You know, I sat under, I've sat under his teaching all this time. I was asking Pastor about that. Uh, I, I don't know if you were in the office, Marie, when I was asking. I asked Pastor, is Marie, is she, would she call you Pastor first or your husband? And uh, we had discussed, we had talked about that because she was saved under your ministry. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that, that is cool. What is it, the answer for that? Am I your pastor or your husband? You're both. <laughs> That's what you said. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're, you're, bo you're, bo you're both. You're both. You know, we don't you know. see a difference. When I went to Bible two. study, you know, I was cool. learning under him, you know. Maria's and never had was, another pastor. But yeah. She's never had another man she called pastor. No. There's been pastors of the church she attended, but she's never had another pastor. I've always been that, and I've always, always tried to live up to that. As long as we've been married, I've tried to live up to that, that I am I am that, you know. I mean, here's the thing. We were talking about this the other day, you know, how that when we were in Israel and I walked by, Marie and I were walking by a synagogue on Shabbat, and we see the children in a playground and the, the wives are, are, the mothers are watching the children, and then you look through the, the windows and you see all the men and the rabbi, and I asked my guide, this is when we first went to Israel, and I asked my guide, how come the women and the children are in a courtyard, the kids are playing, and the husbands are, are in the room getting instructed, why aren't the women there? He said, that's an orthodox uh, uh, congregation. He said, the responsibility of the father is to lead the home in the ways mm -hmm. of the Lord. So they receive the instructions and they take those instructions and impart them to wives and children. And they play the role of the rabbi of the home. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Mm -hmm. You know, you have a woman's event and all the women want to show up. You have a woman's retreat and you have to stop signups because the women, you know, this is true. You have to stop, you limit signups. Then you have a men's retreat and there you're talking to the last week to the men and and we wonder sometimes why america stinks like it does mm. we really do we wonder why america doesn't have any m real men it, it seems sometimes like like the uh like the women are more masculine than the men we've mm -hmm. feminized men because they're afraid they're afraid to stand up and say, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I feel. This is how I lead. And we end up with a bunch of feminized men, you know, and um, that isn't the way God designed us. God has designed men to have a strength that the, the, the wife can look to and trust and, and know that she's secure and know that she's cherished and, and know that she's protected. She, you know, she needs to know that. My wife knows that. She knows that from the time I was young, I would lay my life down for her, mm -hmm. you know, to this day. And yeah, that's just life. And she knows that, John. And I'm telling you that, that she deserves a man who knows the word. She deserves that. She's a godly woman. And a godly woman wants a godly man. And so any single man right now ought to be growing in grace and godliness and and any woman who's looking for a man should not should not um, settle for anything less than the best that God has That's for right. her, because if she just gets married because she's lonely, she's it's possible to be lonely in marriage. Mm -hmm. It's it's possible to make bad decisions, you know. And so for me, it was a matter of, and for Marie, it became a matter of. This is the right person. Mm -hmm. I am I am better with this person than I've ever been with anybody else. And the qualities that this this young woman had when I met her, her kindness and her her she for some reason, for some reason she, she thought I had something she needed. I didn't get it. I'm serious. I didn't get it. 
she thought I had something she needed. And and she believed in me and she needed me and and I didn't know what that meant, John. He, I really didn't. And he takes care of me. You know, he does. But yeah. I'm we en to. we enjoy being together. It's and it's evident. I mean and we can just sit here on a couch and just enjoy. And just because we're old, we can't move. <laughs> <laughs> Any last word you'd like to say to our church before we wrap this up today? I think that if you're struggling in your marriage, uh, to the ladies, I would say um, go before the Lord and take it to Him and pray. Seek the Lord out. Um, that he, uh, Seek Him in a way that... Um, that you would pray for your husband, whether if your husband's not walking with the Lord or whether he's walking with the Lord. But there may be some th areas in your lives that uh, you're struggling in, and, and I would ask that you go before the Lord and, and keep him in prayer. Give those things to the Lord. You don't necessarily have to give them to share them with other people. I think sometimes women make a mistake of telling uh, another f friend uh, uh, all the... Um, sins of their husbands, you know, and I think, take them to God, mm. you know, that's the best place to, 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 to do is take them to the Lord and, and ask, and ask him while you're praying for him, that God would do a work in your heart, that he would give you love for your husband, that he would renew your relationship with him, and that, that he may give you ways to show your husband how much you love him. And um, many, many women have been, many men have been won by a woman who encourages and loves her, their husband. Many men aren't won by uh, wrathful, um, um, uh, wrathful words. Um, they're only diminished. And so let's, let's build our husbands up and, and love them and encourage them in the things of God. I can tell you that I, have in, in, in many years of ministry experience, John, that, that when I have met a man who, who reads the Bible with his wife, mm -hmm. when I've met a man who reads the Bible, prays with her, and agrees with her to do what God says, uh, I've met men who don't have problems in their marriage. The ones that I have seen problems in are the ones who don't spend time in the Word together, don't spend time in worship together, don't spend any time in prayer together, um, who aren't leading. And so these two carnal, natural individuals um, are going to live natural lives without Christ, as if the Spirit doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So for Marie and me, what has been the key? The key has been uh, that together we agreed that we would learn to serve God in His Word mm -hmm. together. Because if there's a disagreement with God, well, I'm the one with the problem. So if I'm trying to lead my wife and we just read something together about whatever, we, we have a blueprint now. We, we, we will agree. Let's do what this says and not what I'm feeling. And right. No, let's do what this says. And so that really has, I mean, again, people might not believe that and it's, it's okay. But um, it's the truth. You know, she and I both have decided that we'll do the best we can to be obedient to what we know. Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You know, so there's there's women who say, well, I'll follow him when he submits to God. Mm -hmm. You know, when mm -hmm. he's like Christ. I, I had a woman tell me that. When he's more like Jesus, I'm going to follow what he says. No, that was just another way of saying I'm never going to follow mm -hmm. what he says because she had set herself up as judge and jury over his spiritual life. See, my mom, again, I learned lessons from my mom. My mom approached me one time after she got saved, John, and she approached me and she says, David, your dad's just not a spiritual man. My mom was kind of quick to, to, to let me know who was spiritual and who wasn't. That was my mom. She says, you're your dad's not spiritual. He doesn't lead me the way he's supposed to lead me. My father, my, my father to me was a good man. The fact that he put up with her, <laughs> he was a good man, you know? So, 
when she when she said that to me, I looked at her and I said, what do you want him to do? What do you want him to do? Do you want him to open up a Bible and give you Bible studies? I said, this is a man who's not gifted and capable of giving you Bible studies, mom, because my mom had opinions about everything. I said, but this is a man who does what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. I said, my dad loves you. And my dad puts into practice the things that he learns from scripture. I said, you have a very good husband, mama. You just want to be married to a Bible teacher mm -hmm. and you can't make him into a Bible teacher. So you need to accept him for the man that he is. And when you accept that, you'll be happy. But as long as you try and change him into what you think he's supposed to be, my father will never be that. Why don't you allow God to mold him into his own image? And why don't you pray for him? Because you've got a very good husband. Mm -hmm. And my mama did. My father mm -hmm. was a very good man. He loved her to the last breath of his life. Yes. My dad loved that woman. And over time, mama realized that she was just trying to shape him into the image of the man she thought he was supposed to be. Because my mom actually told Marie that. She told Marie... <laughs> Honey, you've got to form your husband in, into the man he's supposed to be. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. And Marie knew better than trying that with me. That's right. <laughs> that is not That's gonna not going to work. Gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> so how does a woman change a man? She changes the way the man is by changing herself. Mm. Because men have a tendency, in general, have a tendency of responding to the wife. We respond to one another. Mm -hmm. So if Marie wants me different, she approaches me differently. If she tells me something, I may not listen. Mm -hmm. If she treats me differently, I have a tendency of responding to the way she's treating me. Mm -hmm. And so it's not manipulation. It's simple wisdom to know how to dwell with one another in harmony. And I've learned that with my girl. You know, um, I can tell her, and I'll tell her, blah, blah, <laughs> you know, and, and she'll listen because she's a very respectful woman to me. She will. But I've also discovered if I show her my heart, if I reveal me to her, sometimes with emotion, sometimes with tears, I will say, this is who I am, and, and this is how I feel, and this is what is valuable to me. Because she loves me, she takes it before the Lord. I know she does. And she adjusts mm -hmm. to the things that are important. Mm -hmm. She really does. So, John, I, I really think that this area of controlling and, you know, that's what destroys. But when we learn that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant, mm -hmm. when, when we begin to, to esteem others more highly than ourselves, when we learn to, to die to ourselves, to pick up that cross, to love our neighbor yes. as ourselves, when we begin to do those things, to treat one another as we would be treated. All these things we know, we learned them in Sunday school and in church mm -hmm. services. That's right. When we begin to practice those things, things change. That's right. Things change. So husbands, love your wives. Dwell with them according to knowledge. And wives, submit to your husband and respect them. Thank you guys so much today for joining us and I always enjoy these conversations. It's just more organic, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, the wisdom that you both are, that you both share with our church. And again, the model that you guys are to a lot of us who are married. And so thank you guys so much. And uh, we do look forward to church joining us soon, joining us together. And, uh, and thank you, Pastor and Marie, for coming and, and spending time with us.